We're back with the next in the Art of Spotlight series, and today is a big one. We're taking a look at the work of the legendary Errol Otis. Please stick around. I'm AZ Mountaineer, and this is our channel, Old School Rules, where we celebrate the community of old school gamers and grognards who like classic RPGs, miniatures, magazines, and everything that goes with it. On the Artist Spotlight series, we take a moment to celebrate a particular artist who was an important part of the early era of Dungeons and Dragons. And today, that's Errol Otis. He's one of my favorites. Uh, hopefully, he's one of yours. If you're not familiar with his art, sit back. You're in for a treat. Hope you enjoy today's video. I know I will. Okay, so this, I tell you in advance, is gonna be one of the longest Art of Spotlight videos I've ever done. There's so much art in Errol Otis's catalog of TSR, Dungeons and Dragons TSR um, time. It's gonna take a while to look at it all, but I think it's worth it. I really love his art. Uh, if you're not familiar with Errol Otis, I think he's got one of the most recognizable styles. When I see a piece of uh, Errol Otis work, I know it's his right away um, because of the uniqueness of his style. He was only there for a couple of years, but he did a tremendous amount of work uh, in that period. And as you'll see when we dig into it, his uh, fingerprints, if you will, are all over a whole bunch of the catalog of TSR. Let's get into it. Errol Otis's first work, at least familiarity with for me, is, a, is one little uh, illustration in the Dungeon Master's Guide. So he comes in sort of right at the end as AD&D is coming out. Then the basic edition, right, which was the Holmes edition, is redone, and he does the covers of, uh, of these, as well as a bunch of art on the inside. He paints the cover of the Deities and Demigods book and has a lot of stuff in the interior of that. He's got some things in the, in the Fiend Folio, and he does a number of accessories, um, the covers and some interior art on some of those as time goes by. He also, I'm going to call Errol Otis like the king of the modules because his art is in so many of these different um, adventure modules that were put out in at the very end of you know, the 70s and 80, 81 era. And that's really the, the core golden age, right? And he's just everywhere. And we'll come back and take a look at specifically what he did in these in just a minute. Um, Okay, so he starts with the Dungeon Master's Guide. And in fact, he's not even in the first printing. This illustration, which is pretty classic, uh, I liked it enough to stick it on my t-shirt, um, is, in, is, is in the subsequent printings. It's not even there in the first printing uh, of the book. Okay, so then he, he really starts making his mark here. So when, when they redo the basic rules, they have Mr. Moldvay, and Cook do the basic and expert sets. Errol Otis gets tapped to do the artwork. He does the cover, which is on the box, and of course a little piece of which is here on the cover of the rule books themselves. Both of which, you know, really well-known images. Here's some interior illustrations. Uh, he's got I, a lot of these I think we all remember, right? He's got these weapons here. I remember looking at that a really long time, understanding what a mace and a polearm and thinking about what weapon I wanted to have for my character. He's got the adventurer up here who's leaking coins out of his sack. Um, a couple of monsters, including my, my original impression of what a kobold would look like here. And then this really sneaky cobra uh, coming through the dungeon. Just sort of oozes, right? That, that, that feeling you had when you very first started playing the game. And here's a great one. It almost made my top five list that'll be at the end. Because you've got, I imagine, these adventurers who have won and they've put their magic items from the adventure on the table and they're picking, but then everybody wants, apparently, the magic staff is the best thing, right? And so they're all sort of fighting over that, it looks like to me anyway. And then he did this drawing of a dungeon. <clears throat> Pretty simple, right? But the side view, just showing you the way that would look, and you get the idea of you've got some carved rooms, you've got stairs down, you've got a cave in the water feature. Just so many of the things that were in a classic uh, Dungeons and Dragons adventure you would have made up on your own. And he also provided this key. And I gotta tell you personally, for me, I looked at this a lot when I was trying to draw my own dungeons to make sure I knew the official way to draw the various icons for different things, right? He also had a bunch of illustrations in the expert box set rule book. 
uh, and here's a number of those. The one that probably strikes me the most is the, I think, uh, the fire salamander down here that's got itself wrapped around this uh, other lizard. And then a couple of other images, uh, the alchemist here who's making some potions and then this really spooky skeleton looking guy uh, is another one of a very, you know, just oozes Errol Otis art and style, right? So no discussion of Errol Otis could possibly be complete without a discussion of deities and demigods. He does the cover, one of the most famous, I think, cover images in early Dungeons and Dragons. I understand this hangs, the, the original uh, hangs in the Noble Knight Games online store. If you ever go to visit them, you get to see this uh, there. Hard to tell what that thing would be worth today. Thousands and thousands of dollars. I mean, it would probably get through the roof if they ever decided to sell it. Uh, right inside the cover, he's got this image um, that's just so typical of, of his illustration style. Now, for those of you who don't know, just real quick, and there's another video up here that talks a little bit about the Deities and Demigods book. The first couple of printings of Deities and Demigods had the Cthulhu mythos and the Maldivonian mythos. And so those, those are more collectible. But when you, when you want to talk about art and Errol's art, um, you've got to have that book because there's um, no sort of marriage between a subject matter and an artist style than Errol Otis and the Cthulhu mythos. And we'll see that here in just a second. He's got a, just to warm up to that, right? He's got a drawing in the introduction. He's got a couple of drawings in the um, Native American pantheon. And then we get into Cthulhu. So we've got Cthulhu here uh, at first, and then a couple of just weird um, images around that mythos. And then we get into some of the um, more particular art that's drawn from that, uh, from, those, from those writings, those books. Um, I'm not particularly familiar with Lovecraft, but you know these these images. If you know anything about it, are um, pretty vintage chimps. Let me get myself, in fact, out of the way. I'll let you guys see that a little bit better. Okay. And then here we have a couple more that I've blown up. If I can, uh, if I can pronounce these things correctly, this is on the left: Cthulhu Hoster, the Unspeakable, and then. Uh, Hastor the Unspeakable, and then Migo, which is the crazy flying creatures on the on the right. And then uh, <coughs> here we have a particularly awesome image, I think, that he drew. This is Yog Sothoth. Uh, this just, I mean, what do you say about that image? The eyes, the mouth, the legs, the tentacles. Um, this one's really fantastic. And uh, again, thought a lot about considering this one for my top five as well. It could easily be one of his best. Um, and even if you don't have that particularly rare version of um, of the Deities and Demon Guys, there's still lots of great Errol Otis art available to you. Uh, this is from the Indian Pantheon and it's just fantastic. And again, he's got too many great drawings for me to really pick five, but you know, that's what I do, so I picked five. Um, and then, even though he's really connected to the Cthulhu mythos, here's from the Maldivonian um, pantheon that's in those limited you know, first and second printings, a couple of really cool drawings he did as well. And then when you get back into another section that he did a lot of great work in is the non-human uh, deity section. And so you've got um, Corellon, the uh, elf deity, You've got um, Loth, who's the drow, dark elf deity. And then you've got this guy, um, Laugzed, uh, the troglodyte uh, deity over here on the right. And then some of my favorite, the first one, just because you want to try and say the name, right? The um, deity for the Kuatoa is uh, Blibdulplop. Uh, and then you've got the kobolds, who's uh, Kotolmak, and the ogres. We've got Vaprak. Those are all pretty awesome. Uh, in the Fiend Folio, he does a few things, and I've mentioned this before. In the Fiend Folio, you've got all the monsters, but if you go to the back, there's several pages of indices and charts where you get some fantastic art back there. And so here's a couple of um, Errol Otis art pieces, illustrations tucked away back there in the Fiend Folio, both of which are pretty fantastic. 
Okay, that's sort of the warm up act. Now we're going to get into just some of the most awesome stuff that Errol Otis ever did. Um, I've done a video on the Dungeon Master screen, and at first, the very first printing, it's blank, and then intelligently, they quickly put a piece of Errol's um, art on here on the front, which is a great piece. Then he did the, um, in 79, the player character record sheets come out. Uh, they come out again in 81. Again, great cover art. Um, he does this Dungeon Master's Adventure Log, which has like this, you know, adventuring party. It just sort of feels like you got this adventuring party. Like you can see like there's something up above them, some giant feet, some kind of critter. And then down below, there's some other kind of creatures there. I mean, take a look at this art. There's just a lot packed into it. The non-player character records. Um, these things are, I mean, honestly, when I didn't have these in, in my collection um, more recently, I've gone out and found copies of this to add in, but just, just for the cover art. It's so awesome. Take a close look at the cloud behind this guy, right? The smoke from this candle is filled with drawings and images that are just fantastic. And then we've got the rogues gallery. Um, the cover's really funky. I like it. It's, it's filled with um, pre-rolled NPCs that you could use. And that's okay, that's whatever, right? But the, there's all kinds of great art. The great art from DSL, um, from Jeff D, and Errol Otis has got some great art inside of this book. Then we have the um, uh, permanent character records. And again, just, you know, really cool art on the front. You got a little halfling there who's getting into the chest. You got the warrior who's killed, whatever this is, Basilisk dragon, little dragon or something. Um, and then we've got the reprint. So it's the same art, different color tone given to the character record sheets. So here is a close-up look at the cover art for the Dungeon Master screen. I mean, look at that. Fantastic art. Sort of wonder where all this great art is. Lost, I think, for at least some of it, unfortunately. And here's a, here's a really close look at the player character record sheets. And these things were fantastic, right? When you could get those out, if you were like me, you could, you know, you bought one copy, if you started to run out, you kept one blank of each so you could go make photocopies at mom or dad's place of work or somewhere um, at the local school or something too, so you could keep having those character record sheets. I don't know what this guy is at the top. I think he's just an evil priest with a horned helmet. I don't think he's a monster. Um, you got the lady who looks like a fighter, obviously the little halfling thief. He sort of reminds me of the same halfling that shows up in the um, non or in the player character record cover, I think, as well. And here's that again. Here's that halfling again, right? And a little easier to see the non-player character records. You've got creatures and uh, undead and f fighter and it was maybe a kobold of some sort in that in that cloud vision, uh, including a pig-faced orc. I'm pretty sure. So, just really cool stuff. And then here's a closer look at the drawing from the front of the Rose Gallery. And he also had the, he had the rear cover uh, art on the Rose Gallery product, which is another really good piece of art. So this is I told you there was great art on the inside of the Rose Gallery, and so uh, let me get myself out of the way so you can see some of that. Got a little you know iconic black and white drawing of the ship. The second one here with the centaur is not labeled. So I'll say, you know, in the art world attributed to, I'm pretty sure that's his, just stylistically. To me, it screams Errol Oda's art. I could be wrong, somebody could tell me uh, better. And then here's one of his drawings of this guy who's at the very, this is the very last page of that. Um, this guy with the uh, cup. Um, again, I mean, there's like buried gems in this book. Here is a druid casting, um, I think, insect swarm probably on a mind flare. Um, it's actually really, some people do a video to talk about spells. A really cool, um, really cool spell, by the way. And mind flayers are pretty freaking awesome monsters as well, right? Great art. Um, here's another one. His halfling character again, I guess, fighting an owl, although he's too big for an owlbear, but fighting an owlbear. Um, again, I, I like this one, so it's, it's kind of fun. All right, that's still not the main event. Here we go. This is um, modules, and this is, I think this is the main event. This is where he's just the king of art and illustration in the TSR adventure modules. 
so much in such, but you know, so much in a short period of time. Um, but he came in right at the right time where these were really, they were, they were turning out a lot of these. I saw an interview with Bill Willingham, I think it was, who I think it might've been Errol Otis interview, but one of them was talking about sort of how it worked in the art department and how, you know, you might get to do some illustrations in something. Um, you might get to do an interior cover and then you might get to do a rear cover. And then, man, if you were really good and they liked your work, the primary thing was to get a, you know, front cover on the stuff for obvious reasons. Um, so let's just take a look at what Errol Otis did in his career. Very first, right, this is the mono cover G1. He's got the back illustration. This one shows up in the later printings of that um, as well. Here's the rear cover to, um, to C1. And the rear cover to S2, right, white plume. Really, really cool. And then he's got a rear cover to A2 and A3. I mean, just the rear covers are awesome, right? I mean, you could just, that's the thing about Errol's work, just pick anything and just, it's awesome. B2, keep on the Borderlands, rear cover. Super iconic image. Millions of people, you know, have copies of this, or at least millions of copies got sold. And then we have, um, I think this is uh, I, no, this is L1. And this of course is S1, right? The Tomb of Horrors. Again, almost made one of my top five lists. I mean, you got that, you got the misty hallway, you got the black, you know, who, where does that go? I won't spoil for anybody who's never played that one. Uh, great art man wouldn't you love to have a piece of this art any one of these pieces of art on your wall uh and then remember the torment modules super rare highly collectible right ghost tower um original torment cover and here's the mono cover for for c1 i love that art uh here's the front cover for a4, the last of the Slavers series, and this cover for B3, there's a lot to say about that, but just the cover art here, uh, that crazy, you know, creature, great sense of lighting from below and the dark, you know, goes into the shadow up above. And then uh, here's the, after they redid the covers, right? So here's the new cover for C1 after the mono cover went away. They preserve the old mono cover as the inside cover art on this one. And here, um, here is I1, those frogs, and the exploding, uh, the explosion in the background where the little gnome guys shot some kind of acid blast at the other frog. Pretty awesome. And then finally, this is the cover for S4. And, and that's really, and that sort of bookends it, right? Because if you look at the interior art for S4, the new artists are there. Easily is there. Does a lot of art. Jim Holloway is there, um, and these this classic, you know, core four that were there for years are fading out. Um, so, like I said, Errol's not there for a long time, but man, he does great work. And that was just the covers. And then there's interior art. Uh, these are this is interior art from A2. A couple of drawing stairs going down. There's some creatures down there waiting on you, and this little hag creature. And then he did a bunch of art in the Slavers A3 series, or A3, A3 adventure. Um, get myself out of the way. I particularly like the one with these um, guardians looking down at you, the ones sort of right here in the middle of the montage. Um, this, the, the sense of like, you know, you're down, it's like almost drawn from foot level, like you were a gnome or something. And this little icon, uh, Kind of graphic drawing of the black and white at the bottom with a really creepy creature right in the middle. It's, I think it's just fantastic. Uh, then we have some more interior art. This is from A4. He has the interior cover, which is the cave fish are dragging this guy up to, this, to its ledge to be consumed. Got the giant crab coming out of there. 
this guy swimming underwater, and then these undead creatures covered in fungus and mushrooms, which is pretty fantastic. And some even even more art from A4. You've got the um, the uh, fungus circle here, and then just a really really nicely detailed drawing of um, I guess you'd call it a still life. You know, the boots, the weapons, the stuff from a treasure hunt or treasure that's been discovered. And then you got this drawing, which I think um, if you've ever seen it, you probably remember it. It's just really striking with all these different characters in there. You got the you know you got the monk down there wearing the little for some reason the eye mask the lady on the floor who's probably a thief right she's laughing um wizards uh i don't know what the guy in the middle is we'll say he's a cleric and then the drow fighter over here on the side you only have one piece of art in b2 but if you've ever owned the keep on the borderlands i guarantee if there's a piece of art inside that book you remember it's probably the mad hermit uh, what a great drawing um, just what a great drawing okay I mentioned B3 this is from and if you if you know the legends of this right there's the, we can all buy the green version that's the common version but there was earlier print and what we call the orange cover that got rewritten and some of the art discarded and this is a piece of art that was in that orange version that did not survive um, there's all kinds of funny stuff about this, including comments that the faces on the three-headed uh, creature at the top, maybe, I mean, I, I kind of think maybe, uh, are real people that worked at TSR. Likenesses were used for those, for those drawings. So anyway, really crazy piece of art. Uh, and then we have some, some art from, from C1, and there's a great drawing of... Uh, just this idol with the big circle on the wall and then this fantastic spider over here. And then let me get out of the way. The gibbering mouther appears here. And isn't that a fantastic, fantastic drawing? Nobody nobody else could have done that like, like Errol. And then they had, this is um, one of the adventure modules that had the booklet of illustrations to share with your characters. And so he had a few um, illustrations in there as well. I love this one with the dragon on top of the stairs. And there's really sort of the funny faces on the edge of this mirror. So then we move to C2 and he has some illustrations in there as well. My favorite is probably this uh, interior cover with the Umber Hulk getting blasted from behind. He's got a little um, landscape scene in there as well. Um, and some other interior drawings. Let myself get out of the way so you guys can see the fire bat. That thing is fantastic. That is classic uh, Errol Otis art. And then in the older tournament version, this highly collectible and most of us don't have, there's some art of his in there as well that didn't survive into the um, red covered edition that most of us are more familiar with. Okay, then we move into the D series. And this is from the um, D12 version, right? Not the original version, but the remade version with the Roslov cover. Some drawings here. I really love the one on the right uh, that has the, the two dragons. Now, one of my favorites, almost made my list of top five for sure. And then he only has one piece of interior black and white illustration in D3. He has the cover as well, right? But he has this one drawing, which is the interior cover, but really awesome, very memorable. He did a great job with the drow. Um, okay, so next we're gonna to go to the um, G series. And this drawing at the top is, is only shows up in the G1, 2, 3 combined. And then remember I told you he had the rear cover when it was just G1, and that, in, that becomes an interior illustration, black and white version that's shown here at the bottom. And then he only has one illustration, I believe, in I1, but man, this one is really excellent. It's somewhat abstract with the heavy dark lines, but if you really take, a, take some time to look at this drawing as the party's coming into this room, um, there's this creature down at the, let's see if I can point to it, right there 
uh, his face at the bottom. You got a lizard man down here, all kinds of snake looking things um, up above. It's, uh, it's a really cool drawing. A few of his are like that. Like you really got to stop and take some time to look at them. Uh, then he also has some interior illustrations in L1, Secret of Bone Hill. And the, this one at the top of the undead is fantastic. Then just a um, little drawing of the castle and this eye eyeball creature, the spectator, is pretty darn cool as well. Then we get over to Q1, Queen of the Demon Web Pits. And um, he's got this little castle in the clouds. And then this is just a fantastic, super famous drawing of Loth, uh, her head on the spider body. And then here is a pretty famous map in S2, which shows you White Plume Mountain and has all kinds of, you know, little sayings on the map. And he's got a number of interior illustrations in S2 as well. I love this one with the people and you've got to hop across the bubbling, um, steaming lake below. Good luck with that. And then here's a little trap with the, showing the, the um, water flowing through. He's got this giant crab attacking the party. Um, and if you notice, it's the same people that were up on the stairs, right? He does, he's a little consistent in who, I think more or less the uh, drawing of what the people look like that are coming through the adventure. And then at the end of that one, he's got a drawing of this, uh, a new creature that was in that module called the Kelpie. And if you remember the potential, I don't say alternate ending, but there was this ending where you end up going down the secret hallway, right? And you meet these two, uh, I think they're trolls. So that's a good drawing of that. Okay. S3, he did the covers we know, and here's the interior um, drawing. This one's fantastic. If you're not familiar, S3 has got a bit of a, like a sci-fi fantasy flair to it. There's a spaceship that's crashed in, in the land of Greyhawk, and you go up into the mountains and you explore this giant spaceship. That's the dungeon. So there's all kinds of weird alien stuff going on there. There's laser blasters and airlock doors and all kinds of cool stuff. But uh, so, so in this one has, um, a packet of illustrations to show the characters. So we start off with some very mundane drawings uh, that Errol did here. Hallways, this chamber with some mirrors in it. You've got some type of uh, device here. Of course, your characters won't have any idea what that thing is. Good luck. you got to figure that kind of stuff out. Here's a nice landscape piece. You've got some robots in here. Pretty cool. Take a look at all the, let me get myself out of the way, all the design detail in there. You've got this control panel. I mean, your you know, fantasy characters, what the heck is that? Well, this is what, pull back a little bit, right? Give you a view of some unfortunate folks who did not survive. Some, some people who aren't actually people. Uh, these are androids. And here's a spacesuit. Now you start getting to the good Aerolotus stuff. Um, so here's these creatures that live among all the mushrooms on there. There's another picture of them with their pet dog, if you will. And here's a great drawing of some alien creature that you will encounter on the spaceship, as well as another um, sort of looks like the fire bat from that earlier adventure here, right? But this crazy looking creature, I love it. And then there's a version of this that has some color illustrations in the middle of the booklet as well. And Errol Otis does all of that um, color illustration. Really cool. Look at this thing. That is an Errol Otis creature right there. Okay. I told you there's tons of it. We're not quite done. And now we're going to look at my top five um, black and white illustrations and then my top five cover art. Uh, number five, this is from the Slaver series and uh, is just a drawing of um, one of the, I call them the mushroom men. I, think I, can, I can't remember what their official name is. And this is from, I believe, the expert, basic, basic expert rule set that he did illustrations in. And I just love this guy's like lighting up that dragon, right? This one came from the rogues gallery and this is a roper. I mean, you guys take a look at this thing. So this lady is in bad shape. 
Uh, but she is a tough fighter. She's already lopped off one of his arms. She's got one of them cut pretty severely. Another one's wrapped around her is cut pretty severely. So she is fighting back for her life, obviously. Um, and this one's awesome. This one is from the Deities and Demigods book from the Cthulhu section. So if you don't have that, you won't be familiar with this artwork, but I wanted to share it with you for sure. Uh, if I'm saying it correctly, this is Shub Niggeroth. And uh, it is just this giant bubbling pool of sentient uh, craziness. And then this would be my number one illustration. Uh, remember this one. This is from the, the inside cover from Queen of the Demon Web Pits. And I, I think that's Loth there with, or Loth, with um, two different demons that she summoned. Okay, top five covers. Number five, I go with S3 um, Expedition to the Barrier Peaks just because it was such a memorable and unusual module. And of course, you guys got the laser blaster there on the cover. Um, anyway, I, I love that. I really like that adventure. I remember getting that as a kid. I was so excited because it was so much bigger than normal. For me, for me number four uh, is going to be this cover from the Dungeon Master's Adventure Log. Again, Take the time to really look not only at the characters right in the middle, but look up at the feet and the little, I don't know what those little creatures are with eyes and then some type of tentacles down there that have eyeballs at the end and something that looks like a basilisk or a dragon's head. This is just a fantastic, fantastic um, piece of art in my opinion. Number three, you know, some people probably like it more, but the Deities and Demigods book cover, the painting is just fantastic. Um, it's just it's a really wonderful piece of art. Number two for me would be this cover, which was a uh, adventure module cover for D3, Vault of the Drow. And this was when they reissue it. And it's, she's got the uh, Drow Priestess here with the whip um, staff. I just think it's fantastic. And for me, it doesn't get any better than this. This is uh, Aerolotus's cover for the Mold Bay Basic Box Set. I submit to you this could be the best piece of TSR uh, d and art ever produced, uh, in part because how iconic it is. They're in a dungeon, they're fighting a dragon. It's all there, folks. Uh, plus there's a you know, chest full of treasure. So it's all there and you've got the fighter and you've got the, I think this woman's probably an elven magic user. There's just so many things that I love about the game and the idea of the game, and it's all wrapped up in this great, great piece of art. Gosh, I wish I knew where this was somewhere in the, in the world. I could go find it and convince somebody to give it to me or maybe even sell it to me. I'd definitely pay for it. Uh, yeah, fantastic. So that's it. I told you it'd be a little longer than normal, but that's because Errol Otis is the man, the myth, the legend. His art is fantastic. Um, just really can't say enough good things about him and how much I enjoy his art. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. I hope you enjoy Errol's uh, art. And if you didn't know it, I hope this introduces you to one of the best artists to ever be a part of the game. Until next time, my friends, keep rolling 20s.